Okay. Chapter four, we are now leaving the innate immune system because the dendritic cells outnumber the NK cells. And the NK cells said, okay, this is too much for me. And dendritic cells then went on to the draining lymph node. That's where we're, that's where we left off and that's where we're moving into. Um, and really to learn how the adaptive immune system works, we need to spend quite a lot of time talking about the components of the adaptive immune system, what they are, how they're made, and the background behind them before we can actually talk about how they're used. So take the, the process of those dendritic cells moving to the lymph nodes and kind of just shelve it for now. And we'll come back to that at a later time. Um, and let's spend some time getting the basics down for what actually makes up the adaptive immune system. And we're gonna start out with antibodies. So chapter four is talking about um, antibody structure, talking about the diversity found in B cells and in antibodies, and then how that diversity is generated. So this is a doozy of a topic and there's going to be a lot of new information, things that maybe are outside of what you've ever imagined could be in genetics, but we're going to go there and we're gonna go there slowly and we're gonna have a good time with it. So let's go ahead and just do a little bit of an overview of the chapter that we're gonna be covering. And, um, you know, we often think about antibodies as being a pretty, important part of the adaptive immune system. And that's very true. Um, a big portion or a big, I and mean, we can even say half of the adaptive immune system is dedicated or maybe not half, but a big portion of it is dedicated to this humoral side of the response. Um, and this is the antibody side. And so antibodies are really, really great at clearing extracellular pathogen, as well as neutralizing any toxins that are produced by uh, these, these extracellular pathogens. The cells that create or that generate these antibodies are called plasma cells. And so we'll look at how a plasma cell comes to be. Uh, we kind of touched on that during hematopoiesis, but we'll dig into that a little bit more. And we'll look at where antibodies are located. We'll find that they're located pretty much everywhere. They're a major component of the plasma uh, circulating throughout the blood. They're always present on mucosal surfaces. And then we'll look at what an, intra uh, what an antibody interacts with. And so like how it binds, what it binds, and we'll talk about antigens and how antibodies and antigens are, antigens are the ligands for antibodies. Now, because we're in the adaptive immune system, we're looking at a specific response. And so antibodies are about as specific as you're going to get. And so they are ultra specific, recognizing um, this very, very small pieces of antigen and very specific for those small pieces. And we'll, we'll dive into that. And then because they recognize such a small, minute thing, it's going to mean that there's a lot of different antibodies. And so we have a large diversity uh, of antibodies within the body. And this all comes through B cell development. So during a B cell um, development process, it, B cell is going to be committed to making one certain type of antibody. And we'll look at what that process looks like. Um, <clears throat> and so just a big overview picture here, we have a B cell that um, has bound anti, uh, immu immunoglobulin or Ig, and then that will interact with a bacteria cell, um, epitopes, or uh, I'm using words that we're gonna dig into, but um, it encounters antigen, and then it, the B cell will be stimulated to go on and become a plasma cell that secretes antibody. So that's like the huge overall, very simplistic picture. And we're going to look at each one of these phases in great depth. So this is a big chapter. There's a lot of slides. I'm gonna try to do my best to go through them um, in a, in a quick fashion, but not rush through them, but I'm going to break it up into three lectures. And so this is the first of the three. So let's dive in and let's begin by looking at antibody structure. So you can see this Y here. <clears throat> That's the typical way that we represent antibodies. And actually, when you look at their protein shape, they are kind of a Y shape. They are glycoproteins, so they're made up of carbohydrates and proteins. 
And they're built really from four polypeptide chains. There are two heavy chains and two light chains. Um, the two heavy chains are going to be identical and they're going to be opposite of each other. So our heavy chains here are in green and you can see our, our one, there's one heavy chain, there's a second heavy chain. And then there's going to be two identical light chains and they're going to attach just to a portion of the heavy chain. And so the Y, uh, there's, there's um, disulfide bonds then that connect these chains together. And so each arm of the Y is going to be made up of the full light chain and part of the heavy chain. And that part of the heavy chain is going to be the, anemo, uh, the um, amino terminal. And then the stem of the Y is just going to be the two heavy chains and it's going to be the carboxyl terminal of that pep polypeptide chains. Okay, so there are four chains that are make up uh, a monomer of an antibody, okay? Two heavy chains, two light chains. We will abbreviate them as the H chain for heavy, L chain for light, okay? So you'll see H for heavy, L for light in our, in our next few, well, the rest of the semester. Um, oh, I do have arrows here because I used to not have a pencil to draw. Okay, that's one way we can break it down is heavy and light. But now we're gonna take that antibody image. We're gonna change up the colors a little bit. And instead of using yellow and green, we're gonna use blue and red to represent two different parts of the antibody, two different ways we can look at it. So we still have our heavy and light chains. You can still see the structure is there, but we can now break it up into constant regions and variable regions. The variable region is at the ends of either arm of the Y. So at, if you were to put your arms up, it's where your fingers would be. And that's the variable region. And that is where the greatest diversity in the antibodies is going to be found. And subsequently, that is going to be the part of the antibody that's going to recognize antigen or where the antigen binding sites are. And so you can see these little pockets that are made where the heavy and light chain variable regions join that will be the antigen binding site. And so each monomer antibody or like the representative antibody we have here, will have two antigen binding sites. We'll see that will change as we look at how different antibodies are, are made in full, but we have a pair of variable regions. And so we have a pair of antigen binding sites. Now the constant region is going to not interact with antigen at all, and it's going to have less variability than the variable regions. So we abbreviate variable with V and constant with C. So then we might be able to say, okay, well, we have um, the variable heavy, we have the very, uh, sorry, the constant heavy, constant heavy, constant heavy. We have the variable, okay, I'll see that, variable light, constant light. Okay, so we'll, we'll dig into that, but that's another way that you can divide an antibody up. So you can have heavy chain, light chain, and then you can have variable region and constant region. Okay, let's then look at how these antibodies interact then with antigen. So because, so now we're flipping over here, down here, we can kind of show the antibody like we saw in the last few images. This one's just upside down. But you can see that these disulfide bonds have flexibility in them. And so they're able to bend ever so slightly. And because they can bend, they're able to interact with antigen on the surface of a bacteria cell in this case. And so it's flexible and it allows that antibody to really be able to reach and stretch and be able to interact with multiple antigen. Okay, so now let's take this antibody and cut it and talk about another way that we can divide it. So we still have our heavy chain and our second identical heavy chain. Now we have our light chains that are attached on the side, right? 
But now if we take proteases and we cut, so these scissors are represented in proteases, and they'll cut these disulfide bonds, it will actually break up an antibody into three different fragments. We have two FABs, which are called fragment antigen binding, and then one fragment crystallizable. I know you thought I was going to say constant because why wouldn't you, right? <laughs> fragment crystallizable is what actually what the CFC stands for. And it is because that portion of the antibody readily crystallizes um, when uh, is put into, when, it, when this happens, when this process happens, that portion readily crystallizes out of the serum where the fragment antigen binding are going to stay more soluble. So we will talk a lot about FAB regions and FC regions of antibodies, knowing that the FAB region is going to be created um, out of the heavy and light chains, both the variable and constant, because we, we do have um, the variable um, light and we have the variable constant, right? Um, but then we have the heavy, well, I go, go variable heavy, variable. <laughs> That's good. Variable heavy. Yeah, variable heavy. There we go. Um, constant heavy, constant heavy, constant heavy. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So FAB is another, FAB and FC is another way that you can break down uh, antibodies. And we're going to talk about heavy, light chain, constant variable, FAB, FC, we're gonna use them all. And so it's really important to take the time to um, fully understand what those breakdowns are. So what types of antibodies do we have, right? We have five, in the human, we have five main classes of immunoglobulin or isotypes. So classes, isotypes, same thing. So we can talk about a class of antibody, we can talk about an isotype of antibody. And then also we should see how I use the word um, immunoglobulin um, at the top. And then I have IG behind it. Maybe you can't see is my, is my video over it. Maybe if I move that down, I don't even know if I move my video down or not. Um, immunoglobulin. Okay, IG stands for immunoglobulin. So when you see IG, that stands for immunoglobulin always. Immunoglobulin and antibody are slightly different in that immunoglobulin is everything. So like if we did a Venn diagram, immunoglobulin is in the big circle. All antibodies are immunoglobulins but not all immunoglobulins are antibodies. So then we would put antibodies, AB, in the little circle. So immunoglobulin is abbreviation for, or IG is immuno, the abbreviation for immunoglobulin. AB is the abbreviation for antibody. The difference, antibodies are secreted where immunoglobulins can be secreted, but then they're called antibodies. Or if they're not secreted, then they're called bound immunoglobulin, okay? And so we'll, we'll have B cells that will have immunoglobulin bound to the surface, and that's why it's called immunoglobulin. So immunoglobulin is a bigger term that also includes secreted antibodies, okay? We will we'll look at that. So there's five isotypes or classes. Those words can be used interchangeably, and we call them... IG or immunoglobulin G um, stands for gamma. M stands for mu, D, delta, A, alpha, and then E, epsilon. And so we abbreviate that by saying IgE, IgG, IgM. But knowing that it's based on the constant heavy chain, the constant um, region of the heavy chain. And so the, and we'll look at these chains, but um, so IgG is going to have the heavy chain gamma piece in place. Okay. So oh, this will make more sense when we get, go along. But now across the bottom, you can see the images of these are all the monomers. Sometimes they will, uh, like IgA and IgM can group up with other 
uh, monomers and make like a dimer for IgA or a pentamer for IgM, for example, but these are all the monomers. And you can see they're all pretty similar. They all have that Y. Some major differences here is that IgM and IgE have a fourth constant region where IgG, D, and A have only three constant heavy re regions. Um, another thing to say about this is that Mm, I had something else I was going to say at, at this point. I can't remember. But if you can't remember the five, oh, yeah, there's isotypes. These are the five main classes. There's subclasses of each of these as well, especially G. There's like five or six subclasses. So these aren't the only ones. These are just the main ones. Um, and then if you are trying to remember all of these, it spells Madge, like the name Madge, M-A-D-G-E. Um, as the types of antibodies that we have, the major subclasses. Um, okay, so the chains. The heavy chain and light chain are going to be the same across all the antibodies where we have, we have um, a heavy chain, two of them identical. We have light chains on all of them. The, it, the deal is that, so with the subclasses, they're based on the type of heavy chain, whether it's gamma or mu, oops, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, let's see, get that out of the way. Gamma or mu or delta. Okay, so that's the heavy chain. The light chain, there's actually two different types. There's kappa and there's lambda. Now, essentially there's no difference between the two, or at least we don't know of any difference in function. Um, e each antibody is either going to have kappa light chains or, um, gamma light chains, but or kappa or lambda, but not a mixture of the two. This will make more sense when we look at how they're being created or how they're being developed, how diversity is formed. Okay, so heavy chains are um, mu, um, gamma, delta, alpha, epsilon. Light chains are kappa or lambda. Okay. Here's another way that we can look at um, that we can look at antibodies, and this is what I was starting to do on the other slides, um, differentiating between the constant heavy. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the constant and then the the constant heavy versus the constant light, and the variable. Um, heavy and the variable light. Okay, so this is a diagram that kind of shows that a little bit better. But the variable region of each heavy or light chain is going to make up that variable domain, right? So we have our, our variable domain right here, there, and we have our variable domain here. That's also where the antigen binding site is found. Um, within that variable domain though, there is a light chain, which is that little red one there, um, or uh, a constant, okay? So we have then our, well, it, it's, it's underneath there. It's not a very good picture. But you can see that the heavy chain is, oh, not the constant, the heavy chain. <laughs> see, I do it all the time. I get it mixed up. It's heavy and light, heavy and light. Um, and so here we have the purple is the heavy chain. So we have our variable heavy, we have our, our, and then we have our variable light is the pink. And so we can see that over here on the other side where we have our pink labeled as variable light. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so the variable heavy and the variable light make up the variable region. Then we have the constant region, right? So we have this constant region that is made up of, it's kind of split like that. We have two constant regions. It's going to be made up of one light chain section and three or four heavy chain sections. And so you have the constant light, CL, and then you have constant heavy one, constant heavy two, constant heavy three, and then four if you're looking at, um, at um, uh, mu and epsilon. 
kind of butchered that slide. <laughs> but um, the important thing is that we're going to work through this. It, it really helps if you start to draw things out and you start to model things out where we're looking at our light chains and our heavy chains and our constant regions and our variable regions and, and how they're all put together to make uh, a complete full antibody. Okay, so now the antigen binding sites, that's that variable region where the heavy um, variable section meets with the light variable section, right? And you have that, that pocket there. And within that antigen binding site, there's actually um, a area called the hypervariable region where there's just like tiny little amino acid differences um, within three hypervariable loops. And then these three hypervariable loops are flanked by a little bit more of a constant type region or a framework region. And so they're found in each of the variable domain and they're right at the tippy tip of the antibodies, right? The farthest that you're going to get from the constant regions of both the heavy and the light chains. And um, they are called complementarity determining loops. <laughs> Why not, right? Or regions. And so CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3 are those complementary co complementarity determining regions within the antigen binding site. And those are going to interact with the antigen or with the specific part of the antigen that we call an epitope. And so these antigen binding sites are going to be part of an antigen or another way to word that would be the antigenic determinant. I know these words, the, the amount of vocabulary in this chapter is huge. So the epitope or actually we only use epitope. We very, I mean, I barely ever see antigenic determinant ever used. Epitope is what is used pretty much exclusively. But that is the teeny tiny portion of the antigen that's actually recognized by those CDR regions within the hypervariable region within the, within the antigen binding site. Now, when we're talking about antibodies, Usually it's going to be either a carbohydrate or a protein that's recognized. Now there are exceptions where other macromolecules can be recognized by antibodies or by immunoglobulin, but largely we're talking about carbohydrates and proteins. These are very complex molecules that will have several different epitopes. So any one antigen could have multiple epitopes and therefore can be bound by antibody or immunoglobulin um, of a variety of different antibodies because they're all gonna have their own specificity. And so we would call this a multivalent antigen. So this image down here just compares what a multivalent antigen looks like. There's multiple different epitopes and so different antigen specificity or different antibodies with antigen specificities will bind. Where um, if a multivalent um, antigen has just one repeated epitope, then it's going to be that same specificity because the epitope is the same. When we look at these epitopes, we can even get even more detailed and look at what those antigen binding sites are interacting with. And uh, because we're looking at proton, proteins or carbohydrates, well, these are both protein um, examples, um, proteins are going to be in their native form folded. And maybe the epitopes are created by um, amino acids that are in sequence. Or maybe those epitopes are created by amino acids that are folded close together and they're not in sequence. We have two different names for these. They can be a linear epitope or a discontinuous epitope. Not a huge deal for us right now. It does become a bigger deal when you're looking at um, if an antigen is going to be antigenic in its native form or, you know, it's so like when your epitope mapping is probably the most time you would use this most likely time to use this. And that would be like in a research setting where you have an antigen and you're trying to figure out what part of it is antigenic. 
Uh, maybe one of the most recent and most well-known examples of this was when they did the epitope mapping of SARS. Um, when they looked at the virus, they knew it was a spike protein that was being antigenic, but is that spike protein a, a linear epitope? Is it discontinuous? And then how were antibodies designed to interact with that spike protein? And so this would be when um, this type of information is, is important. Okay, so my last little bit on antigen binding sites is that when an antibody or an immunoglobulin binds with an antigen or binds the epitope, this is only going to be through non-covalent forces, meaning pretty weak interactions. So electrostatic forces, hydrogen bonding is a big one, van der Waals forces, hydrophobic interactions. These things that we learned in chemistry and maybe didn't think about too much anymore are very important in the immune system. Um, and this is important to know because they're going to be sometimes transient. Sometimes they're not going to hang on very tight because they are not super strong bonds between them. The better that the antibody or the immunoglobulin fits with its specific antigen, the stronger the force is going to be though. And then the better they'll hold on and then um, make for a, a stronger response. Because biology is biology, there's going to be several different possibilities of an antibody or an immunoglobulin interacting with the same epitope. But because they're just ever so slightly different, some are gonna be better than others. Some are going to fit better than others and therefore have stronger interactions. And so we call these affinities. When a antigen is bound by really strong by an antibody, that means that that antibody has a strong affinity towards that antigen. So we talk about antibody affinity a lot. So in the immune response, the best antibody out there are going to be those antibodies that bind as tightly as they can to an antigen and not release it. Now, we'll look at how those antigen specificities um, end up being formed in the next lecture.